since you know the nature of the phenomenon generating the response, maybe security would be to, be, would be to convince those on the receiving end of American benevolence out there in the world that you suddenly don't devalue and demean and degrade them as a matter of consciousness and that you actually would treat them as human beings rather than dehumanizing, probably indict people who refer to them as collateral damage, that actually what it is that the United States has defined itself in the world as being is the opposite of what it will be in the future. Maybe if you could convince them of that, they wouldn't be planning to fly planes into your buildings and have you jumping a thousand feet on fire. Maybe. But how would you do that? Because the United States has always proceeded on the noblest of rhetoric. I mean, my God, I wish I'd written some of that prose. The gulf between the rhetoric and reality has always been as wide as the Pacific Ocean, but the rhetoric has sounded good. Probably more rhetoric is not going to get it. I mean, I got the chancellor, interim chancellor, De Stefano, my own university, demanding that I come in with a proof of pedigree card and establish before a racial board, a board of racial purity, apparently the fact of my identity, while he writes glowing editorials that are published in the press about the need to combat racism on campus. And then put those two pieces together and see what kind of cognitive dissonance you get. That's the same guy in the same week. And that's emblematic of the whole. So, no, more rhetoric's not going to get it. How might you actually do it? Well, I had a really, really radical suggestion. This is what drives the Republicans crazy. I mean, they just go frothing at the mouth, scratching like cats climbing right up the wall. Because here's the radical crux of my proposition of how to ensure security for the American public and a whole bunch of other people while we're at it. Let's pretend just for a moment, because that allows for consciousness. And if you've got the consciousness, you've got the possibility of concretizing that consciousness in terms of action. Let's just pretend for a moment altogether that the United States of America and the government thereof were required, just like everyone and every other entity on the planet, to obey the law. Man, now there's a radical concept, flaming anti-American. Government of the United States might have to obey the law, obey the law, obey the law. What's it called? This is a command, a cry, an appeal, an insistence. Take all those words, stack them up, and then put them in front or behind or above law enforcement. I demand law enforcement, beginning with the big laws on the big entities first and then having a little trickle-down effect from there. What are you talking about, obey the law? We got no smoking signs plastered on every flat surface in California. And we can tell the government officials, I mean, cops are not even allowed to smoke in their cars anymore. Nobody, government officials included, except Arnold Schwarzenegger in the governor's office with his cigars, smokes in any public place. We're all obeying the law. No, I'm not talking about these petty regulatory things that they pass off as being laws. That's what they've got you indoctrinated to look at laws being, these little things that regulate every waking and sleeping moment of your life. Buckle up, it's the law. No smoking, it's the law. Cross between the lines, it's the law. No, let's try the one that says the United States cannot lawfully engage in military action abroad without the approval of the United Nations Security Council. Let's start with that one. Let's try the one that says non-proliferation of nuclear weapons applies to the United States as well as it applies to North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. So University of California and Lawrence Livermore Lab are going to have to look for another place to attract revenue than in producing a new generation of bunker bu buster munitions. Let's consider the depleted uranium ammunition is nuclear weapons, okay, because it has the same effect. Not the Big Bang, but it just 
proliferates radiation and somebody else is paying the consequences because when the United States is done using their armor piercer stuff in their homeland, they have to stay there and live with it. But there's more than a few U.S. troops that have found out what that does to you, too. They call it the Gulf War Syndrome. Oh, yeah, they can't figure out what that is, just like they couldn't figure out what the effects of dioxin were on U.S. troops. The stuff that we were exposed to in Agent Orange, it took them 30 years of denying it had any effect. Meanwhile, they can tell you within a tenth of a decimal point how many people are going to die of environmental tobacco smoke exposure and worldwide over the next year. And if you believe that, you come see me about this junk car I got, okay? Because you're going to pay big bucks because it's a collector's item, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I notice the laughter in California goes off when you start talking about that, all right? You got people living down there in Los Angeles where I don't know if you actually keep track of the environmental data from LA, but the atmospheric conditions are some so that you're going to take a newborn baby, never expose them to tobacco smoke, okay, and in two weeks going to have a lifetime exposure to about 70 different atmospheric toxins, saturation point. And in that cesspool of toxins, they're going to worry about poor people's social habits as being a class one or class A or whatever they call it, carcinogen and abolish social space. Oh yeah. Oh, I see people sitting out there squirming now. Mass murder and genocide, man. Go, go, don't you talk about cigarettes. Don't you talk about cigarettes like maybe there's something bizarre about our attitude toward them. Living in the shadow of a nuclear reactor at San Luis Obispo and not wanting you to smoke a cigarette on the street. Okay. Yeah, I got it. I got it. See, it's almost impossible to unpack the pathologies that make up the composition of the American zeitgeist, okay? But denial is certainly one of them. All right. Diversion's another. All right, we're dying, plutonium all around us. We're living in a virtual plutonium dump, so let's not allow anybody to smoke. <laughs> Woo. See, you have to kind of get off that onto something a little more real before anybody's going to treat you credibly, no matter what you say out in the world. Yeah, how about the Geneva Conventions? Don't we have an attorney general, not the one in California, although he'd probably agree, but the one in Washington, D.C., the guy that thinks the Geneva Conventions are obsolete. He's the guy who wrote the draft on licensure of torture. Then you got Viet Den down here in San Diego. Is that where he's living now, the guy who drafted the Patriot Act? He's a miracle worker. Anybody ever see the Patriot Act? Actually look at the thing? Looks like telephone book for San Francisco. And he wrote that in 30 days. Yeah, right. <laughs> Perhaps 911 was a pretext to get something passed they had as a shopping list for repression and had been sitting on the shelf there accumulating pages for about 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. The Patriot Act, my ass. That was basically the final stroke of the repeal of the Constitution of the United States, in case you hadn't noticed, but they call it the Patriot Act. George Orwell must be doing big spins in the grave. Let's try the Constitution of the United States. Maybe we would try adhering to that a little bit. Let's reinstate it. Let's demand that the government reinstate it. Yeah? These are not guidelines. And I suggest that maybe we start at the beginning of the Constitution with a reinstatement, which means the first article, you want to take a look at those Indian treaties, some of this law enforcement business might start right here where you live. Somebody got 26,000 odd acres over there that was Fort Ord when I was being transshipped to Southeast Asia. That was the transshipment point, okay? Fort Ord's where they sent the body bags back to. 26,000 acre abandoned military compound. There's a law in the books that said military installations went abandoned. Revert to first usage claims by native population. What is the local native population got out of Fort Ord upon request? As I understand it, originally the offer of 11 acres, which was rescinded in favor of a housing development, and they gave them 45 acres, is still under negotiation at the present time. Out of 26,000 acres, that's not only non compliance on a treaty that wasn't ratified, but upon which they predicate title. Hell, that's a transgression of federal law in the statutory sense. 